Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 23rd of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which coincides with the 2nd of November, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're continuing with our reading of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. We're currently on the Testament of Dan, who they say is the seventh son of Jacob, with Bilhah. He was the first with Bilhah of the two, just like Gad was the first of the two from the other concubine or handmaiden, Zilpha. Something to keep in mind here, just as the firstborn rejected, the secondborn gets the covenant kind of thing. You see it echoed in history. Adam getting rejected, the second Adam being chosen, right? When Abraham was given of the covenant, it wasn't Yishmael, but went to Yitzhak. When Yitzhak had his children, it wasn't Edom, but Jacob. And then you can see in Jacob, it wasn't his firstborn, or it wasn't even the first two, but it passes over. And even after that, when the birthright goes to Yahusuf and then passes to his children, the second born gets the prominence over the first. It's that echo continuing of the truth playing out here. On the reverse of that, when you had the, the children that were born from the the female servants that were born because of jealousy and antagonistic contrivances between the, the sisters, you have that same pattern. The firstborn, there's usually a negative connotation. That tribe, there's some problems. And then the secondborn, there isn't. So you can still see that pattern, but not necessarily in a beneficial way, even within the, the tribes of the people. And you can see this echoed even within their children and their children's children to our times, because not everyone who is of the is of Yisrael is Yisrael, as it says. Not everyone who's of Abraham is a believer like him. So there's something to keep in mind. But anyways, without further ado, this is the testament or the copy of the words of Dan which he spake to his sons in the last days, in the 125th year of his life. For he called together his family and said, Hearken to my words, you sons of Dan, and give heed to the words of your father. I have proved in my heart and in my whole life that truth with right dealing is good and well-pleasing to Elohim and that lying and anger are evil, because they teach man all wickedness. And this would be all kinds, not every single one. I confess therefore this day to you, my children, that in my heart I resolved on the death of Yahusuf, my brother, the true and good man, and I rejoiced that he was sold because his father loved him more than us. For the Ruach of jealousy and vainglory said to me, You yourself also are his son. And one of the spirits, or Ruachoth of Belier, which is the Greek version of Belial, which means literally, literally without worth or worthlessness right? It's a title for Satan. But one of the spirits of worthlessness stirred me up, saying, Take this sword, and with it slay Yahusuf. So shall your father love you when he is dead. Now this was the Ruach of anger that persuaded me to crush Yahusuf as a leopard crushes a kid. All right, and you see there's two different versions here. But it says, But the El of my fathers did not suffer him to fall into my hands, so that I should find him alone and slay him, and cause a second tribe to be destroyed in Yisrael. It mentions a second tribe in the same way that, I believe it's um, Rebekah, 
mentions being bereaved of two sons in one day at the mention of Edom killing Jacob. Because just as Cain rose up against Abel, he lost Abel, his son, and Cain himself was cut off from all benefit from the from the covenant, right? So a second to suffer it, or the second tribe to be destroyed, meaning the one that he killed, and then he himself for doing the deed, right? Be to be destroyed in inequity, least two tribes of Israel should be destroyed. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading that wrong. Let me read this side too. It says, But the El of Jacob, our father, did not deliver him into my hands that I should find him alone, nor suffer me to work this inequity, which was doing something he knew to be wrong, right? Least two tribes should be destroyed in Israel. And now, my children, behold, I am dying. And I tell you of a truth that unless you keep yourselves from the spirit or ruach of lying and of anger and love truth and long suffering, you shall perish. And then we'll read both sides so you can see the difference here. It says, For anger is blindness and does not suffer one to see the face of any man with truth. For though it be a father towards them as yeah, for though it be a father or a mother, oh, I'm sorry, it goes into one. So let me back up. It says there is blindness in anger, pretty much saying the same thing in a different way, my children, and no angry man sees the face with truth. Okay, so pretty much it's just reiterating. Sometimes the difference is significant enough that you want to cover it because one shows the messianic fulfillment of a thing and the other is removing it. In this one, it doesn't look like there's any contextual difference, just the wording is a little different, but the meaning is the sense is the same. For though it be a father or a mother, he behaves towards them as enemies. Though it be a brother, he knows him not. Though it be a foreteller of Yahuwah, he disobeys him. Though a righteous man, he regards him not. Though a friend, he does not acknowledge him. For the Ruach of anger encompasses him with the net of deceit and blinds his eyes and through lying darkens his mind and gives him its own peculiar vision. You can say like tunnel vision, only seeing what it, what is wanting to be shown to you, right? And wherewith encompass it his eyes, with hatred of heart, so as to be envious of his brother. For anger is an evil thing, my children, for it troubles even the soul itself. It says, for it becomes a soul to the soul itself. That doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe it does to you. It says, in the body of the angry man, it makes its own. And over his inner being, it gets the mastery. And it bestows upon the body power that it may work all inequity. An example of this would be in Cain, in anger, rising up against his brother and giving power to do the deed that he did, right? And when the body does all these things, the inner being justifies what is done, since it sees not aright. And this is a peculiar thing that when we're doing wrong, we, we find, we try to justify it. We try to make it seem right to ourselves and others in what we do. But the truth doesn't need to be justified. It stands on its own. It has no need for man to, to defend him. Therefore, he who is wrathful, if he be a mighty man, has a threefold power in his anger, one by the help of his servants, and a second by his wealth, whereby he persuades and overcomes wrongfully, and thirdly, 
having his own natural power, he works thereby the evil. So a powerful man being like a king, he has power in those that do his bidding. He has the power right here in those he can pay by his wealth, right? Like the mercenaries that Edom hired when he was attacking his brother Yaakov. And then you have that by his own power, he works the evil that he chooses to do or the philosophy of might makes right. It says, and though the wrathful man be weak, yet has he a power twofold of that which is by nature, for wrath ever abides such in lawlessness. The Ruach goes always with lying at the right hand of Satan, that with cruelty and lying his works may be wrought. And this is a peculiar thing. The, the truth goes with reason, but cruelty and lying are in the purview of the evil one who can kill, steal, and destroy, who's a murderer and a liar from the beginning, because there's no truth with him. He has nothing to do with our Mashiach. But even amongst his own, they're constantly in different layers of lies. It's another phenomenon that you can see in modern education with atomic theory. No matter how high up the chain you go, learning about atoms, it's just one progressive inaccurate statement or fact after another uh that's for a different time there but it's the same principle the same thing that you can find in how like freemasonry and things like that work lies and then higher levels of lies and then higher levels of lies because the truth is not with them but the truth is in yahushua and we should all be grateful for that It says, understand you, therefore, the power of wrath, that it is vain. And it says that the, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of Elohim. Our, our wrath is impotent and vain. It doesn't amount to anything if he doesn't allow it. Right? For it, first of all, gives provocation by word. Then by deeds, it strengthens him who is angry and with sharp losses disturbs his mind and so stirs up with great wrath his inner being. And for more witness on what anger can do to you, I want to direct you to the shepherd of Hermas. There's a whole section about how Satan has the purview of when anger comes upon the inner being of man and what we're supposed to do in regards to that kind of thing. Not that it will never happen, but that when it does happen, how a reasonable-minded man should behave. You also have information about anger in its use within the two Ruach oath that rule over every man or in the two ways. And that's mentioned in a variety of places in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Apostolic Constitutions, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Dedicae, the Shepherd of Hermas, here in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, as we've already read, like it mentions in the Testament of Yahuda with the two spirits and other places here. So it's a huge theme, but back on track here. He's trying to show you things that he's went through by experience. And this is something that we should be mindful of. Um, we have a saying that it takes one to know one. I know that from experience in certain ways that I don't need to get into right now at the moment. But in the same way here, Dan, he's lived through and repented of being angry and having these very th sins in his life. And now he's trying to impart to his children or child, depending. I say depending because he, through his being and his treating his brother this way, he lost most of his children. Only one survived after they came into Egypt. Whether they died after him or before, I don't know. But he loses all but one. So either way, it says, for it first of all gives provocation by word, then by deeds it strengthens him who is angry, and with sharp losses disturbs his mind, and so stirs up with great wrath his inner being. Therefore, when anyone speaks against you, be not you moved to anger, and if any man praises you, 
as a set apart men, be not uplifted. So he says, don't get overly emotional one way or the other, right? Don't listen to the praises of men and don't, don't take heed to their curses. Let your praise and boast be in your Elohim, right? Like scripture says. Be not moved either to delight or to disgust. For first it pleases the hearing, and so makes the mind keen to perceive the grounds for provocation. And then being enraged, he thinks that he is rightly angry. If you fall into any loss or ruin, my children, be not afflicted. For this very ruach makes a man desire that which is perishable, in order that he may be enraged through affliction. And again, this is reiterated in a different manner in the Shepherd of Hermas in detail about how it's the superfluous things of this world, the, the, the vain cares and problems that pile up and bother a man when they're not walking in the Ruach. So I highly encourage it. We've made the videos on that before, but we'll get to them again in the course of time. However, it's always good to go back on these things and to remind us where you can find the fullness of these teachings because it's here or there. It's here a little, there a little. He has these things written down for our benefit and edification, but um, it's seen in it in its totality, taking these things together and learning that I find the most benefit from. He literally said two or more witnesses confirm every matter. And I've found that I can literally find the proof of things in multiple ways in multiple witnesses when trying to find them to establish what is real doctrine. I don't, I honestly, I know that he cannot, he will not, he could do whatever he wants, but he will not judge a man over a thing that he cannot prove to be his desire. But everything that we can, we most certainly will be judged for. <clears throat> it says, and if you suffer loss voluntarily or involuntarily, be not vexed, right? It says, take all these things with cheerfulness that happen to you. I believe that's in Sirach. It mentions it in the Apostolic Constitutions. If we know that he has all power and that everything that is, is because he allows it, then there is nothing that happens without his will, and that we should rejoice in Yahuwah always is a commandment. So these things are not disagreeable with the things that we have in our renewed covenant times at all. That's what I'm trying to point out. And the more that you're familiar with these things, if you've read through scripture, if you've read the apocryphal writings, then it sings to your soul. You can see in your being how these connect to one another, right? But if you're not familiar with them, then going over it is how you learn. It says, and if you suffer loss voluntarily or involuntarily, be not vexed, for from vexation arises wrath with lying. Moreover, a twofold mischief is wrath with lying, and they assist one another in order to disturb the heart. And when the inner being is continually disturbed, Yahuwah departs from it, and Belial, or Satan, worthlessness, rules over it. And this is the problem. When the inner being is continually disturbed, I'll let you guys consider what that might mean, okay? But think about the things that are done that cause people to be agitated. And when you are acting in manners that are not fruitful, according to his Ruach, who do you think is leading you? This is why he says it's by our fruits that we will be known. It's in our behavior and how we act and think and speak. Observe, therefore, my children, the commandments of Yahuwah, and keep his law. Depart from wrath and hate lying, that Yahuwah may dwell among you, and Belial may flee from you. 
speak truth, each, each one with his neighbor, quoted in scriptures later on, right? So shall you not fall into wrath and confusion, but you shall be in shalom, having the L of shalom. So shall no war prevail over you. There is an ode that talks about how he had he was there fighting for us before ever our war was, right? The contest to righteousness, which we all, that battle in which we are all fighting in our lives today. Love Yahuwah through all your life and one another with a true heart. I know that in the last days you shall depart from Yahuwah, and you shall provoke Louis unto anger and fight against Yahuda, but you shall not prevail against them, for a messenger of Yahuwah shall guide them both. For by them shall Yisrael stand. And again, that was a continued theme that through Louis and Yahuda would be the deliverance of the children. And that was the line through which our Mashiach came of the tribe of Yahuda from his direct line, but intermarried with Louis. You can see the, the record of that in the what they call the good news accounts with Elisheba or Elizabeth, the wife of Zakariyahu, of the daughters of Aaron, Aharon, of the Kohanim, who was the relation to Miriam, the mother of our Mashiach of the tribe of Yahuda. But either way, it says, But you shall not prevail against them. For a messenger of Yahuwah shall guide them both, for by them shall Yisrael stand. And whensoever you depart from Yahuwah, you shall walk in all evil, and work the abominations of the Gentiles. These are the things that we can see playing out within what we call the Bible, and outside of it in secular history all the way up to our modern times. I don't mean this to be disparaging of any of them of the tribe of Dan or what we can say they became but the fact that they're one of the tribes it's foretold that Dan is one of the tribes and they're also one of them that have to repent we have to with one heart turn back to the truth so him foretelling and these things actually being fulfilled doesn't negate the promises doesn't stop the the literal identity of who we are and the facts that he said that we repent the one thing i want you guys to keep in mind is that while we know where dan went generally uh, denmark and ireland southern ireland they became the roman catholics after they were bell worshipers there for a long time and then from that they've been used to persecute or to um, do evil and attack with hatred and anger here the sons of Yahusuf in what we'd call Britain and America, it's historical fact. You can look at the history behind it, the Irish migration with the potato famines and all those things contrived by the Jesuits to get the Catholics in America to overthrow our country. So <clears throat> these things were fulfilled in their children, but also what will also be re fulfilled is the fact that he repented he repented of his evils and he turned to the truth and his children will have a remnant that do so as well. So that's what we're working towards and the identity, the whole point of knowing the history behind us and the, the general migrations of where we've gone or who we are is so that we can acknowledge that he is righteous, we are wicked, and that we have to turn back to what he said. But right here it says, And whensoever you depart from Yahuwah, you shall walk in all evil and work the abominations of the Gentiles, going a-whoring after women of the lawless ones, while with all wickedness the spirits or Ruach oath of wickedness work in you. For I have read in the book of Hanok the righteous, and that book has what you call the animal apocalypse. It's not full, 
but what it did what it had before would have had all of this all of the mentions of what had happened with his children and then you had on top of that what was given to Yaakov where he was literally shown all that would happen to him and his posterity and then he gave it to them we don't have copies of those distinctly in full clarity anymore so that's the part where we have to look at the things that we do have and realize that what was there is no longer present as we go through and you can see the sections that are missing compared to what we have oh, in different examples you'll see that that is not just um, guesswork but it's usually a very plausible thing it's something that's happened quite often even with what we have in the bible as you guys will see or some of you already know but um right here says this is the key to keep in mind it says, for I have read in the book of Hanok the righteous that your prince is Satan and that all the Ruachoth or spirits of wickedness and pride will conspire to attend constantly on the sons of Louis. If you remember, it was the ones that stood in the gap that be, are attacked. It's not the general, it's not the, the people altogether, but the ones that were supposed to be the lights to the nation. It was the intercessor. It was... Moshe went, Satan went to attack Moshe in the wilderness while he was going, not necessarily against all the people that way, but it was like Shaul when he was anointed and it was given to him to be suffering for the name. The persecutions fell on him and the other parts of the assembly were generally free at that time. It's kind of like the same picture here. When the Levites were given the kahuna, they were put in position of showing light to men and being the intercessor as a type and picture Satan attacked the kahuna with Eli and his sons to try to corrupt it and the people with him. It does the same thing with the kings and it does thing, the, the points of influence or power where he can make the most effect if you keep it and if you keep the, uh, that idea in mind. That's why that happens here. But he says he will conspire to attend constantly on the sons of Louis to cause them to sin before Yahuwah. And my sons will draw near to Louis and sin with them in all things. And that would be the Roman Catholic priesthood and the Irish Roman Catholics. Okay. The sons of Louis, if you remember, it was the sons of Aharon and the Kahuna that were responsible for in causing his impalement and instigating that with the people. Aharon was the one that built the golden calf for at the will of the people there. So this is a type and picture of the things that would happen. And later on, the ones that were supposed to be the lights to the, the people were the ones that were like the, the Catholic priests the, that were leading them astray. A lot of the uh, sons of Louis were that way. Not all of them, but some. They're literally spread out through all the tribes, just like Shimon is. They never had one nation to themselves, as it was foretold. But enough of that for now. This is foretelling those things right here. I'm willing you can see that. And remember, the monarchies of the world are in the sons of Yahuda, and also with the ones that were in the land that rejected him, that had been assigned to people through the ages, that are now returned. Those things are gone over in detail, too. While the northern kingdom was generally the lost tribes, Yahuda was never lost. They were known, and the things that happened to them were horrific, but they rejected the truth and then got the, the curses because of it when he came. This is, And the sons of Yahuda will be covetous, plundering other men's goods like lions. Those are the monarchies there. Al also mentioned in the testament of Yahuda that we've covered already. Therefore shall you be led away with them into captivity, and there shall you receive all the plagues of Egypt, like the red tides, the skin cancer, and literally the diseases of the Egyptians have been on us for the keeping pagan festivals, like we've been doing, uh, literally fulfilled. <clears throat> And so when you return to Yahuwah, you shall obtain mercy. And this is the point. 
they have to repent along with us, right? And he shall bring you into his sanctuary, and he shall give you shalom. And there shall arise unto you from the tribe of Yahudah and of Louis the deliverance of Yahuwah. And he shall make war against Belial and execute an everlasting vengeance on our enemies. And the captivity shall he take from Belial or Belial. Remember, it says he took captivity captive and gave gifts to men in the Psalms there. Also quoted in the Renewed Covenant, and that part in the Masoretic text was tampered with, by the way. That's another evidence of the violence done to the Word by his own before they turned him over to Rome. But it says, In the captivity shall he take away from Belial the inner beings or the souls of the saints. The captivity were those that were dead in him that did not yet have his name because he hadn't came yet. But when he died and he came and he went and preached to them in, in there and he brought them up with him, this is what's mentioned in the scriptures that isn't so distinctly made clear. But Matthew Yahu mentions that there were many that resurrected with him and appeared to many. That would be the captivity that he took captive and they were reigning with him at that time. Right, and turn disobedient hearts unto Yahuwah, the very thing that Yahukanon, the forerunner of Yahuwah, was said to do, right? And give to them that call upon him eternal shalom. My shalom I give unto you. Right. And the Kodeshim shall have rest in Eden. And in the new Yerushalayim will the righteous rejoice, and it shall be unto the esteem of Elohim forever. These are two of the places of the three habitations of men, the thirtyfold and the sixtyfold reward that we've mentioned before, the hundredfold reward, as mentioned by Hanok, and in a few other places, Irenaeus goes into the most detail about, it will be the men that are before the presence of the Father in the Shamayim, and made like the messengers there. There's different levels of esteem. Just as different stars have different lights, you can look up in the sky and see that some shine, sparkle in different colors than others, some are more bright than others. The more you look at them with a telescope or a camera, you can see the divergence and the difference between them. And as each has its own glory, it says, or its own honor or esteem, so the messengers are that way. And so we will be when we are changed, each getting according to the desserts we, we all get. In that very manner, however, <clears throat> you can see the description of the messengers in detail in what's called the ascension or the, the um, martyrdom of Yeshiyahu, in that he has a vision of the coming of our Mashiach and how he hides he, who he is from all the messengers and principalities and powers. How it's mentioned in the, in the Renewed Covenant, how it was hidden from them, but now revealed in us. Yeshiyahu is shown the vision of how all the messengers did not know that the, the one who they all worship came down. So, or the one at the right hand of the Father that they all sing praises to came down hidden and then goes up in esteem. But either way, it says, And no longer shall Yerushalayim endure desolation, nor Yisrael be led captive. For Yahuwah shall be in the midst of it living amongst men. And the Kadosh one of Yisrael shall reign over it in humility and in poverty. And he who believes on him shall reign amongst men in truth. And now fear Yahuwah, my children, and beware of Satan and his Ruachoth, or spirits. Draw near unto Elohim and to the messenger that intercedes for you, for he is a mediator between Elohim and man. And for the shalom of Yisrael, he shall stand up against the kingdom of the enemy. 
which he did when he came, how truth divides and conquers over error. Right? This is there, and this is explained by Kepha in the recognitions of Clement when he talks about the two kingdoms. Therefore is the enemy eager to destroy all that call upon Yahuwah. For he knows that on the day on which Yisrael shall repent, this is important because this is what we've been talking about. Kepha mentions it too. When all men turn in obedience to their maker above, that's when the, the change will come. But we have to willingly do what he wants. And tragically, that is mentioned to come when there are so few in number, a child could number you, right? But this is why we have to pay attention carefully to what's written and work out our own deliverance in fear and trembling, right? For he knows that on the day on which Israel shall repent, the kingdom of the enemy shall be brought to an end. For the very messenger of Shalom shall strengthen... Yisrael, that it fall not into the extremity of evil. And it shall be in the time of the lawlessness of Yisrael that Yahuwah will, it has not depart, but it says not in a bracket there. And this is Yahuwah will depart from them, or it says not depart from them, but will transform them into a nation that does his will. For none of the messengers will be equal unto him. And those messengers are the, the guardian messengers over the other nations. Right? They're not equal to the, the creator who is over his people. And his name shall be in every place of Yisrael and among the Gentiles. Keep therefore yourselves, my children, from every evil work and cast away wrath and all lying, and love truth and long-suffering. And the things which you have heard from your father do you also in part to your children, that the deliverer of the Gentiles may receive you, or the deliverer of the nations may receive you. For he is true and long-suffering, meek and lowly, and teaches by his works the law of Elohim. Depart therefore from all unrighteousness and cleave unto the righteousness of El, and your race will be delivered forever. And bury me near my fathers. And when he had said these things, he kissed them and fell asleep at a good old age. And his sons buried him and after that, they carried up his bones and placed them near Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov. Nevertheless, Dan foretold unto them that they should forget their Elohim and should be alienated from the land of their inheritance and from the race of Yisrael and from the family of their seed. This part, it was in a bracket. They, it's either because they believe it was an interpolation, right? And it shouldn't be there. But this is what's congruent with what you can find about Dan being mentioned with the anti-Mashiach in the writings from Hippolytus and others, where you can see that he, working with Louis and Yahuda, conspiring, they do evil, and they're trying to persecute the birthright people. You can see that through history in relation to Catholicism and its persecution of non-Catholic believers, both in England and later on here in America and elsewhere throughout the world, for as long as Nicolaitan Catholicism has had power. In the 600s, they came to temporal power, and they were just continuing their sword against their persecution against people who had a different belief. But it had been something that had been going on for the 10 persecutions under pagan Rome before then, which were foreshadowed or a type um, of the 10 trials that Yahusuf suffered in his life. 
right so here we go and this is um yeah and this was foretold at the end of dan yeah that was it okay so thank you for your time here i don't know if we're going to wrap things up or not i got to check still but if so you guys have a wonderful rest of your sabbath and we will continue with the next patriarch i believe it would be gad so just one moment. So this will wrap up what we're going to be sharing today in our fellowship here. Everyone on the uh, YouTube that might hear this and everyone in fellowship, you guys, thank you for your time. You all have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath and a great week ahead. Shabuah Tov. And we will see you next time. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to share and if we do forget to put stuff in the chat or do things that we might mention, bring it up. I don't mean to be forgetful for like that. Sometimes life happens and I'm not perfect yet. I do strive to do what is right and I always want to do what I say as soon as I can. But even then, sometimes I can forget when I'm speaking, you know, the topic I have when I'm in the middle of speaking it doesn't happen nearly as much as it used to. But it does happen on occasion. I think it's used to keep me humble still, <laughs> which is a story for another time. But the point in that is that his word is true. We should be very careful about the things that we say. It will bite us in the butt, especially if we're walking contrary to his will. But you guys have a great yom day. You have a great week, and we will see you next time. Shalom.